you very much. Um, so this talk will be about uh, part of one of those five topics that uh, Philip discussed. Uh, not quite, but uh, it's in the same spirit. So I'll be talking about uh, twisted bilayer not double bilayer graphene. Uh, and most of this work, uh, at least the original work, was done here uh, at the Mag Lab in Florida State. Now, Philip has already mentioned this a little bit, uh, but let me go through this again, uh, because the principal character in this story will be played by electrons in graphene. Uh, let us just start by briefly reviewing this physical system. I'm sure most of you have done this as an exercise uh, in your course on solid state, but nevertheless, uh, just to establish uh, some of the notation, etc. So imagine that we have a monolayer graphene. Uh, we're going to approximate it by a perfectly flat layer of carbon atoms. Uh, the distance between the carbon atoms is about 1.42 angstroms. And now imagine that the, the pi electron, the one that's sticking out of the board, can uh, hop around uh, on this lattice, uh, and we half fill it for just a second. Uh, everybody knows that the solution to a simple type binding model with, let's just say, nearest neighbor hopping uh, on this will give us a spectrum that has two bands. Uh, that's because this is not a Bravais lattice. There are two sites per unit cell, so therefore that's why we get two bands. Um, and then these two bands touch at two inequivalent points in the Brillouin zone, um, which can be taken to be this uh, hexagon. Uh, and uh, near these two inequivalent points, we have a massless Dirac equation. Of course, that's uh, famous and very well known. Um, this is, of course, uh, as uh, Philip mentioned, protected by inversion and time reversal, uh, assuming that we don't have spin orbit coupling. If you have spin orbit coupling, which is always present but tiny, you can open up a tiny little gap here, but it's at such low energy that it's uh, uh, not practical to discuss this. All right, so. Once again, we have these two inequivalent points, k and k prime, and these are the contours of constant energy uh, that schematically show the dispersion uh, near these points. This is where our Dirac points will sit. Okay, so now uh, imagine you take two of these, you place them on top of each other, and then you twist them relative to each other by some angle theta. Uh, as you can see from uh, this picture, uh, you will create a new superpotential there's a new periodicity in this uh, system. It may not be exact periodicity, but uh, it's uh, approximate enough. Um, and if this angle is small, this new so-called Moray superpotential will have a large period. So the smaller this angle, the larger this period is. And this new superpotential is going to scatter the Dirac electrons that I just discussed from one layer or the other and fold the Brillouin zone and in principle create new set of bands, okay? Now, uh, the question would be what kind of bands are these? Uh, can we fill them with electrons uh, by the uh, gate, the way described by Philip in a previous lecture, and uh, perhaps study something interesting about these bands? Of course, this is well known. Uh, what should we expect? Um, well, so let's say that the blue here is the original Brillouin zone of the bottom layer. Uh, this is a large wave vector, so approximately the inverse of the carbon lattice distance. Um, and this is where our Dirac cone used to sit. Okay, now imagine for a moment that these two layers are completely decoupled. Okay? So then uh, the twisted top layer will have a twisted Brillouin zone. That's the red. And the Dirac cone for the twisted layer will not fold exactly on top of the Dirac cone for the other layer. Uh, now imagine you take a cut that goes between these two lines and you plot a dispersion along that cut. What is it going to look like? Where, well, the blue one has a uh, Dirac cone. Uh, the red one has a Dirac cone. And if there's no coupling between them, there's going to be a, a level crossing here and here. And if the angle is small, then in the momentum space, these two Dirac cones uh, will be close to each other. Okay, so clearly there's an energy scale associated with this uh, setup, even if you do not couple the two layers. And that energy scale has to do 
with how far you have to go between this crossing and the neutrality point. Okay? And you control that energy scale with the twist angle. Because the Fermi velocity is more or less set for you. It's about 10 to the 6 meters per second uh, in, uh, in graphene. And since you control this distance, the momentum space, by the angle, you're with that slope, you're controlling this energy scale. Okay? So the smaller the angle is, the smaller this energy scale is. So now imagine you add the interlayer coupling. What's going to happen? Now imagine for a second that this interlayer coupling is weak. If it's weak, then weak compared to what? Let's say it's weak compared to this energy scale that I just described. <coughs> well, then this level crossing will turn into an avoided level crossing. Okay? And you're going to have one here and one here. And remember, this is along this cut. We have a new periodicity, periodicity, so we should fold this. So don't pay too much attention to these tails over here. The important part is here. Okay? Now, there is another energy scale in the problem, uh, and that's the strength of the coupling. Uh, and that strength determines the amount of level avoidance here. And so you can have a situation in which, just like in here, the angle is off the so-called magic angle when this energy scale is small compared to the energy scale associated with this crossing. If that's the case, well, you're going to get more or less a wide band, even though yeah, you're dealing with a twisted bilayer graphene, uh, with maybe a little bit of a renormalization to the Fermi velocity uh, at these original Dirac points, but not much happening. On the other hand, you can imagine that this energy scale held fixed by the chemistry of the carbon and the bilayer uh, can now become comparable to the energy scale of the crossing simply by tuning the twist of the angle. And at that point, you see this level of repulsion uh, will become comparable to this energy scale, and you can hope to flatten out this band. Okay, so you start pushing, uh, so the, this level of repulsion starts pushing these two bands apart, and you have a chance of flattening this out. Um, now, uh, let me illustrate a slightly more sophisticated calculation, and I will describe how this would be done as we go along in this lecture um, by uh, showing you a little movie in which we're going to change this uh, twist angle. And of course, as we, as we decrease this twist angle away from the, uh, uh, this is not a magic angle, as you will see, uh, towards the uh, magic angle, uh, we're going to be increasing the period of this potential. Okay? So therefore, the new super Brillouin zone, the Moray Brillouin zone, is going to be shrinking constantly. So instead of replotting this uh, for every size of the mini Brillouin zone, let us also rescale the Brillouin zone. So on this axis, uh, these points just correspond, correspond to points in the mini Brillouin zone due to the super potential, which is continuously being rescaled as we're going to change this angle. And I'm going to show the dispersion along this particular cut. So the Dirac points are at k prime and k. And you can see, uh, well, the k is right here. That's the Dirac point associated with the k. And there's another one at k prime. OK? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Correct. Strictly speaking, it's defined for commensurate angle. We can, to pretty good <coughs> approximation, define it for incommensurate angles as well if you go to a continuum limit. And actually, that's how this calculation, this particular calculation is done. As I mentioned, I'll discuss how to do this calculation later in the lecture. But I just want to show you the main effect. Okay, so uh, so we're going to decrease the angle from 3 and watch what happens to the energy. And when you approach about 1.1 or so, the bank becomes very flat, and past that point, it gets brought again. Okay? So uh, uh, at about 1.1, you have created relatively flat band. And if you notice this, I don't know if I can dial this back uh, to uh, I don't know, let's say here. It's also isolated from the rest of the spectrum. Okay? Now, um, 
because the because at this angle, the superlattice period is about 13 nanometers, you need a lot fewer electrons to completely full or empty this band per uh, area. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is accessible using standard uh, uh, techniques that have already been available. So for example, we would need something like 10 to the 12 or so electrons per square centimeter, which is uh, no problem with the, uh, with the gating. So we can empty this or, or fill this and study what happens. And of course, uh, there was a major breakthrough in this field uh, announced in the March meeting of last year, where in the MIT uh, group of Pablo Harillo Herrero, uh, they noticed that when this band is uh, partially occupied, uh, it becomes insulating uh, and at low enough temperature. And near these insulators, superconductivity appears. So uh, these are the plots from their paper uh, showing two terminal conductance. So just to give you some idea about what is uh, going on here, uh, in this regime over here and over here, uh, that narrow band is either completely empty, so we are sitting in basically a trivial band insulator in which the so-called remote bands uh, that are highly dispersing are separated by uh, uh, an energy uh, which will turn out to be of order 30 to 40 milli electron volts from the narrow band. So this is a trivial band insulator. This is also a trivial band insulator. So over here, you fill that band with uh, the electrons. Uh, as you will see when we do the count, there are about, uh, well, there are eight electrons that fill uh, this, uh, uh, this Brillouin zone, this unit cell. Um, and then this point here is the neutrality point. You see a, a drop in the two terminal uh, conductance, but it doesn't quite go to zero. On the other hand, if you are uh, near, uh, uh, well, measured relative to the neutrality point, two holes or two electrons per unit cell, uh, there are signatures of uh, insulation. Superconductivity appears nearby. And there's also a dip uh, in the original data uh, at, um, at three uh, electrons relative to the neutrality point. So again, some signature of an insulating uh, behavior. <coughs> Um, this does not happen if the angle is tuned uh, significantly away from uh, the magic uh, angle. So for example, it will, as you will see, it will not happen when the angle is about 1.27. Uh, there was a previous data at uh, 1.8, I think, published a couple of years ago by Pablo's group, um, where they saw the super lattice band gaps, but they didn't see any signatures of correlation in between. Okay? So the basic idea is to try to understand what's going on here. Now this was quickly followed up by uh, experiments from uh, other uh, groups. Uh, this is data from Andrea uh, Young and Corey Dean's group in which uh, uh, in addition to confirming uh, this uh, effect, they had a sample which was tuned to a, a different angle from the so-called magic angle. Remember, magic angle is about 1.1-ish, maybe a little bit less. At 1.27, this is the gray curve, uh, not much is seen, okay? So again, you're tuning density. Uh, this is the conductance. And uh, you have the neutrality uh, point uh, where presumably you have Dirac uh, cones. Uh, you have a suppression of conductivity there, but again, it doesn't go quite to zero. And maybe there's a dip here and there's some signatures here, but it's certainly not a full insulator. So this is not a magic angle. Your band has not been completely flattened out. On the other hand, you can tune it such by applying an external pressure. So remember in this little cartoon, oh, let me go back to this. Um, in this little cartoon, there are two energy scales. One is the energy scale associated with this crossing and that's set by the angle. So at 1.27, this is presumably too high at ambient pressure. On the other hand, if you apply external pressure, then the the coupling between the two layers, get layers get bet gets better, and that will increase the size of this uh, level of repulsion. So again, you can tune to a situation where these energy scales are comparable even when you start out away from the so-called magic angle okay, and flatten out the band this way. What's the advantage of it? 
Well, the advantage is that you're now at a larger angle, which means you have more carriers uh, per area in your unit cell. Oops. And when they do that, so when they apply this pressure, by the way, there is also a fine-tuned value of the pressure uh, because um, as you increase the pressure, the level repulsion gets larger. Uh, so again, there is an optimal value for this pressure uh, at which, uh, even if they are away from the magic angle, they observed uh, insulation at two holes and two particle, two electrons per unit cell, as well as the insulation at three uh, electrons per unit cell, and signatures at, uh, at one, okay? And this sample also showed superconductivity uh, on this side and then on this side. Okay, so that's, that's shown here. This is uh, uh, the sample under pressure uh, at uh, two holes per unit cell. It becomes an insulator at low enough temperature and if you uh, go slightly away from that, uh, then the resistivity uh, drops. Uh, this was then followed up by uh, remarkable data from Dimitri Efetov's group uh, in Barcelona, in which they had a sample uh, which showed insulation at essentially every integer filling of the uh, narrow band, uh, so including the neutrality point, and superconductivity almost everywhere in between. So these data have been reproduced. We know that the phenomenon is real, and the question is to try to understand uh, what's going on. Now, if you were to plot the local density of states for this narrow band in real space, uh, you would discover that, and this was already shown in the original papers by Pablo's group, that this local density of states is peaked at a triangular superladder. Uh, and in particular, it's peaked at the so-called AA spots. Uh, this is the part of the twisted bilayer where the two carbon atoms, the two honeycomb lattice, are in perfect or approximately perfect registry. So everywhere you have an A, everywhere you have an atom, there's an atom right below it. And uh, th the same is true for the other sublattice. There are, of course, regions where you have the so-called AB or BA arrangement. Um, where it's true for half of the atoms, but for the other half, uh, wherever you have an atom, there's a middle of the plaquette underneath. And these AB and BA regions uh, uh, have smaller uh, density of states. Okay? So based on this picture, you may naively conclude that, well, maybe what's, ho what's happening is that the electrons are getting somehow localized to these peaks, and there's some triangular lattice, um, and uh, because the bandwidth is getting narrower, the electron-electron in interaction starts dominating, and we have some problem of uh, maybe electrons hopping on a triangular lattice with some large Hubbard U, perhaps with some additional flavor. So I'll try to convince you this is not quite right. Uh, it's not the right way to think about this problem. Um, and uh, as was shown by uh, several groups, including ours, the correct choice for the centers of the Vanier states is not at the AA site, but rather at the AB or BA sites. And I'll come back to this uh, uh, as we go along. And this will have important repercussions for the, the, the type of uh, 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 effects that the interactions will have. Yes, please. Say that again? So you want to perform a mirror reflection between the layers? I will discuss the symmetries. There is no mirror reflection between the two layers. There is a twofold rotation okay. uh, between them. And that, uh, as you will see, I, I'll discuss all the symmetries. There's a, there's a particular twofold axis. Uh, <coughs> Wait for a second, yeah. Okay, I just want to uh, uh, set up this contrast that uh, it will not quite be a Hubbard model on a, on a triangle lattice type physics. It will be a lot more interesting. Uh, actually, there's one more point that I'd like to make, which you have already seen. Um, so naively, it may seem that the band is getting narrow because we're decreasing the angle. And this would make sense uh, 
uh, if the band kept getting narrow as you decrease the angle. Why? Because as you decrease the angle, the super lattice period gets larger. And presumably, if you were localizing the electrons only on this triangular lattice, the hopping would be getting weaker, and so the bandwidth would be getting smaller. Right? Uh, now, it turns out that that's not, that cannot be what's happening here. Because, as you saw in the little movie, the bandwidth got narrow, but then when you decrease the angle past the magic, the bandwidth increased. But when you decrease the angle, you increase the super lattice potential, period. So the reason why the band is getting narrow cannot just be because you're separating these peaks. It has to be more subtle than this. In fact, it has to be because of an interference effect. Um, okay. So we, of course, are all aware of flat bands in solid state in the so-called atomic limit. If you just uh, imagine that you take uh, a substance which has S and P levels, let's just say, and then you uh, uh, imagine that the distance between the atoms increases, uh, at some point the atomic clouds stop overlapping uh, appreciably and the bandwidth gets very, very narrow. Uh, so in this limit, you would have to increase, the, and this becomes exponentially small, but it becomes zero only when the distance uh, is infinitely uh, large. So uh, I would like to contrast this example of a flat band, namely the flat band in atomic limit, with another example of a flat band that you are aware of, and, and that's Landau levels. Okay? If you put, uh, if you solve Schrodinger or Dirac particle problem quantum mechanically in the external uh, uniform magnetic field, you will get uh, Landau levels, which you can think of as uh, flat non-dispersive bands. Um, but we know that these are not flat bands in the atomic limit, okay? Uh, how do we know this? Well, we know this because uh, the, uh, the orbitals, let's say in the Landau gauge for this, have a spread roughly set by the magnetic length, and if you place two nearby uh, with each other and compute the matrix element of a particular potential, there's a finite matrix element uh, uh, in principle. You have to separate them past this magnetic length for it to be exponentially small. On the other hand, the dispersion is exactly flat. Okay? So that's happening, again, because there's a subtle interference uh, uh, of the kinetic energy operator uh, between the two uh, Landau gauge wave functions. So, so these are two extreme cases. And we also know that in this particular case, there's, there isn't really a good way to think about this in terms of a localized limit, especially if you want this to be described by Vanier functions, which we, from your solid state course, know are uh, uh, localized functions on a lattice of, uh, 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 of sites, um, which are orthogonal to each other, and they form a complete uh, description of these Hilbert spaces. We know that this is impossible uh, if you expect exponential localization of such Vanier functions. So these are two extreme and very different uh, limits uh, yet, as far as energetics is concerned, they both look the same. You have flat bands. Okay? And the physics here of partially filled flat bands is very different than the physics of partially filled uh, uh, atomic limit flat bands. Okay? Um, so the first thing that uh, I would like to discuss uh, in this lecture is are Moret flat bands equivalent to atomic limit? Okay? As we will see, it's, uh, uh, this is not they aren't quite equivalent to the atomic limit, but the situation is not ex as extreme as the Landau levels. It's somewhere in between. So here's the perhaps a bit ambitious outline for the two lectures. Uh, we're gonna start by studying the nature of these low energy bands uh, and uh, their topology. Once we, because of course, everything is motivated by trying to understand the type of correlated phases that can appear we would like to build the Vanier basis for this. This is a basis that I described, which is localized on uh, a lattice, and at least in strong coupling limit, uh, would be the correct way to start, uh, or ho hopefully useful way to start uh, uh, to think about uh, the possible strong coupling phases. So that's the next thing we're gonna do. We're gonna construct these Vanier states. Then we're gonna project the one over our Coulomb interaction uh, onto this uh, subspace of the four bands described in terms of Vanier states, and then try to solve the strong coupling problem 
uh, at least at commensal scale. So that's the outline. Uh, so let us start it with a way to solve for this band structure. There are many different ways to do this. One could start directly from an effective uh, field theory, but uh, perhaps a little bit more pedagogical would be just to start from uh, two twisted honeycomb bilayers and solve a tight binding problem on this. And this is where this issue of uh, do you actually have a perfectly commensurate angle or not uh, comes in. So let's start with the top layer. Uh, we're gonna assume that the top layer is just held fixed. It's not rotated. Uh, the honeycomb lattice is not a Bravais lattice, as I mentioned. It's really a triangle lattice with a basis. Uh, and so the triangle lattice is spanned by these two primitive lattice vectors, and the basis would be then this uh, vector. Now we're gonna take the bottom layer, and to describe a general, a general situation, we can do the following thing. We can first offset uh, the two layers relative to each other by some distance d. So that's a vector that would uh, go between uh, here and here and then pick a random point in this lattice and then rotate about this random point. And we obtain something like this. Okay. So uh, mathematically, the top unrotated layer can be described by this lattice, uh, set of lattice sites. Tau is the basis. So for alpha equal to zero, uh, that's the uh, one sub lattice. This would be zero vector. But for alpha equal to one, this vector would uh, take you from here to this point. And the rest is just the triangle lattice, spanned by these two primitive lattice vectors. So the T here st stands for the top. The sites of the bottom layer can be described uh, uh, through the sites of the top layer, if we wish. The D is the shift, uh, and the P is the vector to the point around which you do the rotation. And this R theta is a rotation matrix uh, that will rotate us about the z-axis by some angle theta. So we know how to relate the sites in the top layer to the sites uh, in the bottom layer. Why do you use D here? Well, why not? So, so general, <laughs> general, se general setup is what I described. I take two layers. They're exactly on top of each other with AA. And then in principle, I can shift and then pick a random point and then rotate. Would it affect the rotation? It will not very much. But let's be general to start with. Uh, so uh, we can then try to solve the tie binding problem, uh, which will have hopping within the layer. So this would be hopping within the top layer. Uh, it will then have hopping within the bottom layer. And then in addition to that, it will have a hopping between the layers. And uh, now uh, for <coughs> the actual calculations that I will show you, uh, previously people have actually parametrized these hopping constants. So how was this done? Uh, well, it turns out that you cannot quite do the ab initio DFT uh, for magic angle. There's some progress recently, but uh, uh, certainly prior to the discovery of the magic angle twisted by our graph in physics, uh, the DFT was unable to reach the uh, magic angle. The reason for that is because you, at about one degree, you have about 11,000 carbon atoms per unit cell. And that's prohibi prohibitively uh, expensive in terms of computation. But so what people did is they chose the angle to be larger. Uh, and at a larger angle, you have, of course, have a smaller number of atoms per unit <coughs> cell. And there you can do DFT. Uh, and then you calibrate these uh, hopping constants to the situations where you can do DFT, uh, check it for the angles where uh, you can do DFT, it works. And then you just simply extrapolate that to a uh, small enough angle where the number of atoms is prohib prohibitively large, okay? So, so this in general is not just the nearest neighbor hopping. It has a further neighbor hopping and it will be cut off uh, after uh, uh, exponentially uh, smaller uh, uh, hopping is reached as you move further away. And now for, for this term, which couples the two layers, you can just imagine in your computer code that you uh, uh, scan through the top layer atoms, and then you ask where within the bottom layer are the atoms. And if the, bottom and if the atoms are within a certain radius, where this is still uh, sufficiently large, then you introduce that matrix element into your Hamiltonian. And uh, if it's too far, then you neglect it. Now you go to the next atom, you scan it around, and you keep doing this until you fill in your matrix. 
Now, for this, uh, to actually solve this problem on a computer, uh, you would like to have the two lattice, the, the angle to be commensurate. Uh, right, so this is what I described. Now, uh, let's say that it is commensurate, and let's just say, for sake of argument, that we choose to rotate uh, about the AA side. Okay? It will not be super important, but uh, again, for, uh, to, to be uh, explicit, uh, let, let's choose that site uh, around which we're going to perform um, a uh, uh, rotation by a commensurate angle. So um, in this case, so let's say blue is again the top layer and the red is the bottom layer. So somebody asked about the, the, the symmetries here. So what are the symmetries of this problem? Uh, because the angle is commensurate, we do have a translational symmetry. Uh, and in this uh, uh, illustration, the primitive, the new primitive lattice vector would be this L1 and L2, and any combination of the two, integral com uh, combination of the two. In addition to that, we will have a threefold rotation axis uh, pointing out of the board uh, from this side. You can convince yourself that, uh, well, this red uh, dot goes into this one, etc. This blue goes into this one, etc. And uh, there's another generator, uh, which is the twofold rotation uh, through the plane of the board, or more precisely, uh, halfway through the dimer uh, between these two sides. So it isn't quite a reflection. It isn't quite a mirror reflection, but it's a, a two-fold rotation uh, about, uh, about the axis that goes through the plane. Okay? So for example, you see that this red side, which is uh, on the bottom layer, under a two-fold rotation, will then go into this uh, blue side and vice versa. Now, um, and that's it. Uh, for, for this setup, uh, the, the point group is so-called D3 and is generated by what I described. Now, uh, in principle, uh, you could ask, is there another two-fold rotation uh, in this case? Uh, namely, if I had a two-fold rotation about the axis perpendicular to this C2 prime and C3, remember C3 is pointing out of the board, C2 prime is in plane. If I had this one, then uh, you see this red atom would have to go into another blue atom over here. But that's clearly not happening. Right? Or this blue would have to go into a red over here, this red over here, etc. So that axis is strictly speaking absent, okay? But if this angle, if the twist angle is small, then that axis is almost there, okay? And this will play some role uh, as we uh, go along. So one way to describe this commensurate setup is to uh, see that there is a restriction on how you get from this point to this point. So let's follow the blue arrows, which is the uh, which is the unrotated uh, top layer. Uh, remember, there are two primitive lattice vectors, um, and so let's follow this one. So we have one of these A2s and two A1s that will take us from the origin to this uh, point. Now, we can get to the same point uh, on the red one, on the red lattice, but uh, it's one of these A1s as opposed to two and two A2s. Okay? So to describe uh, a commensurate angle, we're going to need two integers, m and n. Um, and the equation that they have to satisfy is uh, this, where the a1 and a2 are the primitive lattice vectors of the two <coughs> layers. Um, so as I said, a pair of integers, m and n, will then define our commensurate uh, structure and a twist angle. Uh, so it's not a difficult exercise to find the relationship between the angle theta and m and n. Uh, you simply realize that these two are related by this rotation matrix, um, uh, which is uh, this, as you know, it gives us two equations of two unknowns. We solve for the cosine and for the sine, and uh, we find that this is the relationship between the angle and the integers. So if you're trying to do this by yourself, you would presumably first like to figure out what these integers are. This will tell you what the angle you're studying, and then just uh, set up your tight binding matrix. Now this was, uh, this was done uh, before the discovery of the uh, magic angle twisted by oleograph in phenomenology. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the parametrization that is being used for these hopping matrix uh, elements uh, is the one that's calibrated from the uh, DFT. And as you see, uh, 
as you start making these set of integers larger and larger, uh, uh, they're offset by one, uh, the twist angle gets uh, smaller uh, and smaller. Okay? And you can clearly see that there is a pattern that emerges on this uh, new super triangle lattice. All right, so now imagine we solve this problem. What do we get? Now it turns out that if we solve it at an actual magic angle as experimentally measured, so 1.1 degrees or so, then the, uh, the narrow band will indeed be separated from the remote bands from above in energy, but not from below in energy. And this is already present in the original Nature paper by uh, Pablo's group. Uh, we think we understand why that's happening uh, now. It has to do with the relaxation of the two layers or corrugation uh, of the two layers. But uh, when we uh, did this calculation, we did this in um, March 2018, we noticed that if we do not relax the two layers, we can choose the angle a little bit away from the magic, so not 1.1 but 1.3, and this particular type binding calculation will indeed produce the bands to be separated. Since experimentally we know that they are separated, um, the description of this Hilbert space is just as good as the description at the magic angle with the relaxation. Okay? So this is what we're going to study. Now, uh, as you see, not including spin, we have four bands uh, uh, in this uh, mini Brillouin zone. And so with spin, we can put eight electrons uh, per unit cell to completely uh, fill it. Now, um, if we were to zoom in to the dispersion at the gamma point, we would discover that there's an exact degeneracy uh, at this point. And the, the two uh, states, the two block states at the gamma point at this energy uh, form a two-dimensional representation of this point group. In other words, under rotation, you will get an admixture of these two. This is an, uh, for the experts in the audience, this is the E representation of D3. And so is this. Now, if we were to zoom in at the K point, we would discover that at the K point, we have one Dirac point, but then there's a small gap between the uh, other two. And in fact, uh, this is also a two-dimensional representation. We check this, it's an E representation, but uh, these two obviously have to be one-dimensional representations, A2 and A1 for the experts in the audience. But this is a clue uh, to the fact that I described, that I mentioned before, namely that we shouldn't be choosing the <coughs> centers of the peak uh, in the local density of states as the centers of our Vanier state. So our task is now to describe this Hilbert space in terms of some localized basis, because then we can try to understand what happens when we add interaction. <coughs> So I think I mentioned this already. Um, now, uh, imagine that this rotation angle was not commensurate, okay? We can still go back to our microscopic picture and then try to derive a low energy theory for uh, the states in the vicinity of K and K prime. So how would we do this? Well, uh, we would go back to this and simply Fourier transform everything. Um, and then uh, notice uh, in this notation where G1 is a uh, large reciprocal lattice vector uh, of the individual honeycomb lattice and G2 is the other one, um, that, uh, let's see, that we can derive an effective continuum model where for each valley um, we would only keep the states which are near the Dirac point and near the rotated Dirac point in the bottom layer, okay? And then if we only keep three uh, scattering wave vectors uh, and neglect intervalley mixing, then the effective Hamiltonian will look something like this, uh, where this interaction, uh, well, hopping between the two layers is described by this matrix T of R, which is shown here. So this part, of the Hamiltonian is just a massless Dirac particle. This is the rotated massless Dirac particle, and this is the coupling between the two layers. And this coupling will be periodic uh, in this lo low energy effective uh, theory. Um, and so even if the angle is not exactly commensurate to this 
level of uh, approximations, you actually obtain a periodic problem. Okay? Now, um, uh, the, there are two independent parameters uh, in this interlayer hopping piece. Uh, one is so-called W0 uh, and the other one is W1. And loosely speaking, W0 describes the tunneling between the AA sites and W1 describes the tunneling between the AB sites. So there are regions in space which are AA-like, and uh, this is the part that describes the tunneling there, and there are regions in space which are AB-like, and this is the, what describes the tunneling between those two. Uh, the, the, the relative strength of these two parameters is not set by symmetry, okay? So in principle, they could be, uh, they could be anything uh, uh, you want. Uh, one has to fit this either to an experiment or to some uh, precise ab initio calculation to figure out what they are. Uh, all right, and this angle theta is two pi over three. Uh, these three little Q vectors that are sitting here uh, are the uh, edges of the uh, mini Brillouin zone hexagon. So this is an alternative way to describe this uh, uh, band structure without the necessity of having a, a commensurate angle. And, um, and in here, you will automatically get a conservation of the number of particles and spin within each valley separately because the two valleys are completely decoupled. In the Taibanding model, there is some coupling between the valleys. Yes? So you mean you mean Q1 and Q2 are separated by Q1 and Q2 are separated by Q2? You mean Q1 or Q2? Q1 and Q2. Oh, these. Yeah. Right. So that's the large that's the large Brillouin zone. So G1 is this one. And G2 is this one. It's a large Brillouin zone. Okay. All right. Uh, this is a relatively straightforward exercise. Uh, No, no, so, so, so right now, I still have to solve a Brock problem to figure out what the bands are at this effective, uh, at this effective Hamiltonian. I haven't solved the Brock problem for this. Okay, but so I have to solve it for four bands for now and then find the bands for three for three. So, right, so, so there are two different ways to think about this. One is, let me s honestly solve the tie binding problem yes. without any approximations for commensurate twist angle. Okay, then the, the result, sorry, the result is this. You've got four bands. With spin, you can put eight electrons per unit cell. Now you can say, well, but maybe the angle is not exactly commensurate. Uh, and uh, maybe I'm not exactly rotating around the AA site. Can I generalize this? So I'm showing a way to generalize this by going back to the original equations, uh, uh, getting the low energy effective theory for this, which turns out to be another Dirac block problem which I now have to solve to figure out what happens to the bands. But I can't tell right now how many bands there are. Hopefully, if they are one to one or close enough, I should still get four bands. But at this point, I don't know that. I have to solve the problem. Of course, you do. So uh, you do get four bands from here. Uh, so with spin, you get eight uh, electrons per unit cell filling the, the, the narrow band. Uh, hopefully, this is clear. Yeah. That's an excellent question. So if, the, if you just solve the problem that I showed, namely that the two layers are undistorted, then they should be the same. <coughs> On the other hand, experimentally, uh, it turns out that, well, the AB arrangement is slightly more energetically favorable because it's a Bernal stacking than the AA arrangement. So the system will have a tendency to increase the size of the region of the uh, unit cell that is in AA, that is in AB registry, and decrease the size that is in the AA registry. And if the two areas are not the same, then W0 and W1 will not be exactly the same. Any other questions? All right. Um, and you can take this model uh, and solve for the bands. This is taken from a paper by uh, Liang and collaborators. Uh, again, uh, uh, at the magic angle, you will find four bands uh, uh, which have uh, uh, their own valley quantum numbers. So the black is uh, one valley and the, 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 dashed is, uh, the dashed red is the other valley. So again, four bands, 
with spin, you, put, you can put eight electrons per Moray unit cell to fill the narrow bed. All right, so, so now we see that at least in this effective model, where the two valleys are separated, and you solve, remember, in this effective Hamiltonian, uh, you do not have any valley mixing. So the, the black curves are the solution to the block problem uh, uh, without any valley mixing. We see that we have uh, two Dirac cones here for the black dispersion, and the red one, of course, it will have its own two Dirac cone. <coughs> we can ask, uh, what is the relative winding number of these two Dirac cones? So why is it useful to think about these uh, winding numbers? Well, uh, imagine for just a second uh, that we go back to ordinary monolayer uh, graphene. So in that case, we know that ignoring spin orbit coupling, because of inversion and time reversal symmetry, we can find a basis in which the effective Hamiltonian does not contain the sigma three Pauli matrix. So N here is a smooth periodic field, uh, smooth periodic function of Kx and Ky in the Brillouin zone, okay? So uh, this part would be describing something like a particle hole asymmetry. Um, and then uh, this part would be describing, uh, wh where it vanishes, would be describing where the Dirac cones are sitting. Remember, this N1 and N2, uh, if you solve a tight binding problem, are going to be smooth and periodic in K. So where do we expect the Dirac cones to sit? Well, the Dirac cones will sit where the off-diagonal element will vanish entirely. Why? Because the spectrum is just going to be N0, that's just an overall shift, plus or minus square root of N1 squared and N2 squared. It's a simple problem to solve. So the Dirac cones will sit wherever this object vanishes. Now let's think about this. Um, this is a function of two variables. And a function of two variables uh, will cut zero through a line, generically. So let's say that the set of zeros for N1 uh, is the blue curve. Because this is smooth and periodic, this is of course obviously not for graphene because it's a uh, square lattice, but it illustrates the point. Because it's is, it is smooth and periodic, uh, this blue line has to be repeated in the other uh, Brillouin zone, okay? Uh, now, uh, but the zero has to occur where both of these vanish. So there will be another zero of this function N2, which in general will be different than uh, N1. And they may intersect without fine tuning, okay? And wherever they intersect, you get the two Dirac points. And you can convince yourself that uh, if you restrict, if, if you impose these to be smooth and periodic, then at the intersection of these two curves, if you look at the winding number, so inside of this red curve, let's say the function is positive, so N2 is positive inside of the red curve and is negative outside of it, um, N1 is positive inside of the blue curve but it's negative outside. If you go around this, let's say in a counterclockwise sense, you go from plus plus to plus minus. On the other hand, if you go, uh, you have to go uh, 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 clockwise to go from plus plus to plus minus. So the winding numbers of these two Dirac fermions will be opposite. In fact, if you try to make these functions smooth and periodic, and you only want to have two Dirac cone, cones in the Brillouin zone, you will not be able to come up with a scenario in which their winding numbers are the same. They will have to be opposite, okay? Now, uh, obviously, one way that you could gap the system out without introducing the sigma three matrix is to distort these functions. So let's say you start, uh, uh, you start subtracting from N1, a constant. That's fine, that's a periodic function. So then the, the size of this blue circle is going to shrink, and at some point it's going to detach, or you can in principle even move it, it will detach from the red curve. What has happened is that two Dirac cones has, have merged, they have annihilated, and you open up the gap, okay? Um, 
So that's a standard scenario, and this is what would happen in a monolayer graphene if you could strain it sufficiently that you would bring the two Dirac cones from the opposite corners of the Brillouin zone together uh, uh, and gap it up. This, of course, requires unrealistically large strain, but in principle, this would be possible. And the reason why I'm uh, elaborating on this is because it turns out that in this twisted bilayer uh, setup, if you go to the effective model that I described, there's an additional symmetry, namely there's a two-fold axis uh, that uh, uh, I claimed in the actual microscopic model with the AA registry is strictly speaking absent, but it emerges in this effective theory. And uh, this is another two-fold axis in the plane between the two layers. So it's perpendicular to the one uh, I already have and, to the, and it's perpendicular to the one that's out of the plane. Let's call this one C2 double prime. With this one, there's then there's then another two-fold uh, axis that would be pointing out of the board. Now, it turns out you can prove that if this two-fold axis and the product of this two-fold rotation and the time reversal is present, and if you don't have any valley mixing, then the winding numbers uh, of this field are actually the same. They're not opposite. This can be proved. This was done uh, uh, by uh, Central and Ashwin Vishwanath group. And because these two winding numbers are the same, uh, you see that we cannot find, so the winding numbers are the same, there are no uh, smooth and periodic functions in the Brillouin zone, N1 and N2, which would have, uh, which, would, which would arise, which would give rise to this. They cannot, you cannot find such uh, functions. And this basically means that in this basis, you will not be able to find exponentially localized Vanier switch, as I will show you. Um, there's another way to show this topology of this band. Uh, again, remember, this is all sort of emergent. It's all happening at this effective uh, uh, continuum uh, model level. Another way to do this is to construct so-called hybrid Vanier bases. So it's relatively simple to do this. It's a, it's a, these are a set of Vanier functions, a little bit like Landau gauge uh, uh, states. Remember, in the Landau gauge, uh, you have exponential localization in one direction, but in the other direction, it's a plane wave, okay? And you can do this for these bands. Um, you don't have to do anything fancy. All you have to do is find eigenstates and eigenvalues of what's essentially a position operator. It's not, R is not quite uh, uh, just R. It's e to the i, and then there's a small delta q which is uh, the distance between these two uh, points in the Brillouin zone along this axis, which in the limit of a large system, you'd like to make infinitesimally small. Um, and then you project that onto the subspace of interest. So why is it that you do this as opposed to just project <coughs> the position operator? Because the position operator by itself is of course not periodic. And you would like this uh, to respect block symmetry. And so if you uh, make this delta Q 2 pi over L, L being the system size, then your system <coughs> will be periodic. Then your uh, operator will be periodic. So this is, if you wish, a periodic version of a projected position operator. And we're gonna try to find the eigenstates of this projected position operator. Um, we're gonna seek these eigenstates in the form of uh, uh, a superposition of the block states. Um, since this does not involve a translation in the direction uh, uh, associated with this quantum number, one uh, direction uh, will still be translationally invariant. And so this K will still be a good quantum number, but we will have to mix all of these block states along this chain of dots. And these mixing coefficients are these alpha. So now we're gonna try to find the eigenstates of this, which are of this form. This will give us equation for these alpha. The B here stands for the band. So in our case, there are two bands. It can be one or two, let's say. You can show that um, uh, the, the, the appropriate equation contains this uh, uh, overlap matrix of the periodic part of the wave functions at the nearby K points. Um, and you get this recursive set of equations such that when this matrix acts on the undetermined coefficient in the dot in front, um, it's uh, equal to the eigenvalue times uh, the coefficient in the dot before. And since this is recursive and since it comes back uh, around, you can uh, solve this 
uh, there is a particular matrix which is called a uh, Wilson loop uh, matrix by uh, these gentlemen. Um, and the eigenvalues and the eigenstates uh, uh, can then be uh, related to the eigenvalues of this Wilson loop matrix. <coughs> okay. Um, it turns out in this particular case, this uh, uh, Wilson loop matrix has the uh, following form. It, it can be brought into uh, uh, an exponential of some uh, uh, angle and then a Pauli two matrix. So how should we think about this angle physically? So uh, th this angle will give us an information about the average center of our hybrid Vanier state. In other words, if you had a Landau tube, then uh, uh, by changing this angle, you will be changing the center of the position of that Gaussian of the Landau tube. Okay? Of course, we are on a lattice. This is not quite a Landau tube. Uh, uh, so it's a little bit more complicated. But nevertheless, this angle will be tracking the center of that, uh, uh, of that tube. Now, um, so let me show you what happens when uh, we actually solve this problem uh, in the effective continuum model. And we're going to change the ratio of W0 to W1. Uh, we're going to start with setting it to 0 and then increase it to something like a realistic value. Uh, as at least that's what's believed to be a realistic value. In each case, uh, we find two solutions because the Wilson loop matrix is a 2 by 2 matrix. So they have, and it's a unitary matrix. So there will be uh, two solutions on a unit circle uh, described by this angle theta. Uh, and they cross. In other words, as we change the cut through the Brillouin zone, the centers of our two Vanier states drift. One drifts in this direction, and the other one drifts in this direction. This should remind you of what happens to the uh, Landau gauge eigenstate. As you perform Laughlin's thought experiment by th threading a flux through the tube, what happens is that the tube drifts. And that's what happens to one of them. But then you have the other partner, and it drifts in the opposite direction. So that means that this band is really composed effectively of two states. Uh, one behaves like a churn number one, and the other one behaves like a churn number minus one. One of them, if it could be separated, would have a whole connectivity one, and the other one would have a whole connectivity minus one. Okay? And as you see, as you start changing this ratio away from uh, the special one, uh, you still have a crossing of these Wilson loop eigenvalues. And this persists. In fact, you generate extra crossings, but the number of crossings is still odd. Uh, this persists all the way to the, uh, uh, to the more realistic uh, values. So there is indeed a topology uh, to this uh, narrow band, assuming that you neglect the effect of intervalley mixing and assuming that you have this C2 rotation, this is a twofold rotation about the axis perpendicular to the plane, followed by time reversal. And this is perhaps an explicit demonstration uh, of that. You just have four bands. I have four bands if I have both valleys. This is per valley. The two valleys do not talk to each other in the continuum model. Make sense? Okay. And this is true for each individual. Okay. Uh, yes, please. That's an excellent question. Uh, uh, this is not the best answer to this question because we're still trying to understand the actual consequences of this. But one way to think about this is the following. Um, if you're at this value of k, so you're cutting your Brillouin zone, uh, uh, let's say over here, <coughs> then it looks like as you, as you uh, start changing it a little bit, there's a very quick drift of the center of these uh, hybrid Vanier states. But when you come over here, in this region, they're almost stuck. So you could be tuning uh, your uh, flux in the Laughlin's gauge uh, argument, and your Vanier states are just sitting there. So in this window, it's actually acting as if it was an ordinary insulator. If you had an ordinary insulator, you wouldn't have this winding number. It would just be flat. So it's a strange mixture where it's act some of it, some of these states are acting as if they were uh, not topological at all, as if they were part of an ordinary insulator. But in these tails, 
they uh, indeed remember, oh yeah, we actually came from something that has two churn, uh, where you have a churn plus and churn minus state. Well, that's, that's if you have the symmetries that the edge respects. C to T is not a symmetry that the edge respects. Okay. Um, okay, so there's an interesting consequence uh, of the fact that your uh, winding numbers are the same. Um, now, imagine that we add this. I still have a minute. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so I just want to go through this because uh, I want to tie it up with, uh, with an actual experiment. So uh, there's a very interesting consequence of this fact. So uh, remember, uh, this two by two matrix uh, is missing a sigma three. Now, there's one way to add this sigma three matrix. One way to add the mass is to align, as uh, Philip mentioned, is to align the uh, graphene with the boronitride. That's because uh, B and N have opposite uh, local potentials and that will stagger the A sublattice relative to the B sublattice in energy. So because the two Dirac cones have the same winding number, even though nominally this staggered mass is a trivial mass, it will actually give rise to two states, to two bands, one with churn number plus and one with churn number minus. It will now separate out these two bands. So in the situation where the boronitride is aligned, you can now imagine that at filling, where now including the other valley, you would want to have one uh, uh, of these bands filled, the interaction effects may force, let's say, all the holes to sit in the churn plus, churn, uh, plus band. Or maybe it would force all the holes to sit in the churn minus band. And in fact, uh, this, uh, 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 such a state would then display quantum anomalous hole effects. Okay? And that has been observed. There are two experiments. Uh, one is by David Goldhaber Gordon's group, where the quantization has not quite been observed, but the anomalous Hall effect has been observed on twisted bilayer graphene samples aligned with boronitride at mu equal to three. Okay, that is uh, that is three electrons added relative to the neutrality point. Uh, and in fact, there was also a hysteresis observed. Uh, there was a follow-up paper by Andrea Young's group where the, even the quantization uh, has uh, clearly been seen. So uh, I think this is a good place to stop and then maybe we'll pick up uh, on the rest uh, in the second lecture. Okay, thank you for your attention.